Yes. Yes, it's, it says to me the online. Yes, uh, today, a uh, very nice day for us, for the conference. Uh, I am Murat Dondran, Yildiz Technical University. Uh, I am the moderator of this uh, session. Uh, and of course, this session will be with Robert John Aumann. Uh, he was born in Frankfurt am Main, Germany at June 8, 1930, and fled to the United States with his family in 1938. And he's graduated from the City College of New York in 1950 with a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics. He received his Master of Science in 1952 and his PhD in Mathematics in 1955, both from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, he is a mathematician and a member of the United States National Academy of Science. He is a professor at the Center for the Study of Rationality in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. He also holds a visiting position at Stony Brook University and he is one of the founding members of the Stony Brook Center for Game Theory. Robert John Aumann received the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2005 for his work on conflict and cooperation through game theory analysis. Today, he will present one of his last work titled A Synthesis of Behavioral and Mainstream Economics, published in Nature and Human Behavior. And we have a very nice session, I hope. This session has 60 minutes presentation and this is the 45 minutes for the introduction and the presentation and 15 minutes for question and answer will come from the YouTube channel online. Uh, at the end, thank you for everything, Professor Robert Aumann. And now it is your turn for presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, uh, everyone in the audience. I'm very pleased to uh, be here. Uh, and uh, uh, participate in this uh, symposium on economic thought. And uh, this is precisely uh, what I want to talk about, the economic thought, economic uh, theory. Um, so let's get started. So uh, as the uh, uh, moderator said, just a moment. Oops on here. Uh, wait just a moment. Just I um, see your cursor on the screen. There, there's a just a moment there's a problem here. Escape. Okay. <laughs> Every and, time we have such kind of problem, don't, don't worry. What's that? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe you can uh, close the sharing your screen and again you can share the screen. Maybe. Okay, stop share. Yeah. Okay, stop share. And now we start the again. share screen again. Okay. Share. Okay. Maybe on the right, on, uh, right corner, uh, there is a, some arrow. Maybe you can click the arrow on the on on your screen. For me, it's a right position, bottom of the right. More. Just we have a arrow. You see? Uh, yes. Okay. Here. Yeah, yeah. Now, something's. Yes. It's ah, here we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I hope uh, is for the second page it will work because there is no error now. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. So this uh, this appeared in uh, Nature Human Behavior, as Professor Don Durant said. And uh, let's get started. Yes. Uh, why, why do we do economic theory? And the answer is, well, to understand how the economic world works, obviously, <laughs> that's the obvious answer. But the question arises, 
but economic theory assumes rationality. And what do we mean by rationality? We mean that people act to promote their goals. Now, behavioral economics, which has uh, come to the fore in the last uh, 20 years, actually, um, actually it was uh, founded by uh, Kahneman and Tversky uh, almost 50 years ago. Uh, the first paper be, uh, appeared in Science in 1974. That's already almost 50 years ago, but it really caught on in the last 20 years after Danny Kahneman got the Nobel Prize in, uh, in 02, okay? Well, behavioral economics has shown that uh, people do not act to promote their goals, okay? Uh, they act by rules of thumb, heuristics and biases, and often they uh, poor results. In other words, the, often they get results that uh, do not uh, promote their goals, okay? They're stupid, <laughs> okay? And uh, people behave uh, irrationally, stupidly. Yes? In other words, uh, by rationality, I mean that people act to promote their goals, to do what is good for them, yes, what they want, yeah? And, the, and the, uh, behavioral economics has shown that they don't. Often, often they don't. Not always, but often. Often they don't. So, uh, uh, so we're going to use a, a, um, the, the philosopher Hegel yeah, uh, had this, uh, um, had this, uh, idea of a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis. So uh, 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 the thesis is an idea, and then the antithesis is the opposite idea. The synthesis is putting them together. That's what we're going to try today. So the thesis is economic theory. Just like we said on the previous slide, the rationality that people act to promote their goals. The antithesis is behavioral economics, okay? Irrationality. People uh, act by rules of thumb, often with poor results. They don't act to promote their goals, okay? Uh, so we're gonna suggest a synthesis and we call a synthesis rule rationality. People act by rules of thumb that usually but not always promote their goals, okay? And the conclusion is that economic theory is relevant after all, because uh, what people usually do is what dictates what goes on in the economic world. What people rarely do does not make a difference in the economic world, okay? Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's what people usually do, okay? Now, we don't claim priority for the observation that the rules usually promote people's goals. Well, I'm not the first guy who said that, okay? Uh, so who said it before? Who said it before? So uh, I, I quote uh, a, uh, the literature, in general, these heuristics are quite useful, okay? But sometimes they lead to severe and systematic errors. Now, guess who said that, okay? Tversky and Kahneman themselves said it. In their original paper that I mentioned before, Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases in Science in 1974. Okay, they themselves said it. Okay, and then uh, we have another person who said it. These heuristics are often useful, but they sometimes lead to characteristic errors or biases. And who said that? Well, not Tversky and Kahneman, but Kahneman and Tversky, okay? Uh, uh, are the and they said that 20 years later or 22 years later, in the Psychological Review in 1996, okay? 
So I say that uh, what I'm saying, I don't claim priority for it. So what is new today? What am I, why am I uh, giving this thought? And what is new is behavioral economics dwells exclusively on the sometimes, the severe and systematic errors where the heuristics do not work. In our humble opinion, the insight that behavioral economics yields into the in general, where the heuristics do work, is much more important. So I'm not saying they're wrong, they're right, they're right, okay? But they don't concentrate on the right thing, okay? Because uh, economic theory works because people usually, according to their own, uh, uh, um, they themselves say it. Uh, because people usually do act rationally, okay? And we do claim priority on this observation. When do the rules lead to severe and systematic errors? Not just sometimes, okay? But when? What, what is the reason that people, that the rules lead to severe and systematic errors? in exceptional or contrived situations, okay? Exceptional or contrived. Why? Why do they lead to severe and systematic errors then in exceptional or contrived situations? Because the rules which were not consciously adopted, so this, they're right in that. People don't figure things out, okay? They act by, uh, heuristics, biases, rules of thumb, they don't figure things out. But the rules which one uh, did not spring from nowhere, the rules did not spring from, they evolved biologically or culturally. Evolution does not work on the exceptional or contrived situation. Evolution, the way you, uh, the, these uh, rules of thumb evolved and if there is an occasional exception, the rule still works. Evolution works by survival of the fittest. A rule survives, in other words, it's adopted, if and only if it works well when repeatedly applied. That's why it survives. An occasional instance where it does not work has no effect. Okay, no effect. Uh, so the rule, it sometimes it doesn't work. So, so uh, uh, that doesn't change the rule. And of course, a contrived situation certainly has no effect since it never occurs in practice. Now, what I'm saying is that very many of the heuristics and biases and the experiments of the behavioral economists are contrived, okay? They're not natural. They don't occur in nature. They don't occur in practice. Examples. So I'm gonna start with the most famous, uh, I think, uh, example of uh, behavioral economics of Tversky and Kahneman, and that is Linda. Linda is a young, single, outspoken, and very bright. As a student, she was deeply concerned with discrimination and social justice. Is it more likely that Linda is a bank teller or that she is a bank teller and an active feminist? Okay. So now, uh, um, a, a considerable majority of people, yes, you know, like 72%, I think it was, say that she is more likely that she's a bank teller and an active feminist than that a, she is a bank teller. And of course, that's nonsense, yes, right? <laughs> because if you're a bank teller and an active feminist, then you're also a bank teller, right? So it's less likely, okay? <laughs> it's maybe not much less likely, but it's certainly not more likely that she's a bank teller and an active feminist than a bank teller. But 72% or even 
I don't recall, I think it was 72% said that uh, she, it's more likely that she's a bank teller and active feminist. Well, this is, uh, we'll, 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 we'll give another example before we go on. There's a nursery rhyme, a rhyme that, an old English nursery rhyme that you tell children, okay? And it goes like this. As I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. Every wife had seven sacks. Every sack had seven cats. Every cat had seven kits. Kits, cats, sacks, and wives. How many were going to St. Ives? Okay, that is how it goes. So well, let's do the calculation. The I is one, uh, the man I met is one. He had seven wives is seven. Every wife had seven sacks, that's seven times seven. Okay, the number of sacks is seven times seven. Every sack has seven cats. So the number of cats is seven times seven times seven. Every cat has seven kids. So the number of kids is seven times seven times seven times seven. So altogether, that is 2,802. All right? Right? Is that the answer, 2,802? No, wrong. <laughs> yes. The correct answer is one, okay? Why is the correct answer one? Uh, because, uh, I was going to St. Ives. The man I met was not going to St. Ives, okay? <laughs> he was not going to St. Ives. I was going to St. Ives, okay? So the, the, I, the, the number is one, okay? Here's another example. Why did Napoleon wear suspenders? Who knows the answer to that? Why did Napoleon wear suspenders? And the answer is to hold up his pants, <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah, uh, so what is going on in all these examples? What's going on in all these examples is that there is a rule that governs all these examples, the heuristic, a bias. And what's the rule? It's the relevance maxim. When you are told something, you assume it's relevant, okay? You, know, you tell this long story about Linda, yes, you assume it's relevant. The people who answer that question, they don't think a lot. They hear social justice, discrimination, and so on and so forth. Feminist, and they hear feminist, so it's feminist, okay? They assume it's relevant. The long story in St. Ives, you assume that the, the, the long story about the wives, the sex, the cat, you assume it's irrelevant to the answer, okay? So, uh, uh, so you say 2,802, okay? Why, otherwise, why do you say all these things? Yes. No, why did Napoleon wear suspenders? You assume that Napoleon is relevant here, that Napoleon has something to do with it, okay? Uh, 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 everybody wears, uh, everybody uh, wears suspenders. Why do we have suspenders to hold up our pants? But why did Napoleon? One assumes that it's relevant. Okay, so uh, uh, so these are trick questions. Okay, they are trick questions. They're contrived. You don't meet them in real life, okay? You meet them in a, in a radio show, in television. You don't meet this kind of thing in, in, in real life, okay? Uh, and, and that is the most famous example of behavioral economics. Let's look at some more examples. And I have a list of 17 examples. And one is overeating. We'll talk about that. Hyperbolic discounting, we'll talk about that. Uh, the, the discontinuity in, uh, in action when we go between 100% and 99%, there's a big discontinuity there, and Tversky and Kahneman talk about that. We have the ultimatum game, the endowment effect, 
and uh, a, a number of other things, probability matching. People choose a higher probability of getting killed in combat. Anchoring, bees, artificial flowers, and nectar. Reinhard Selton's umbrella. Reinhard Selton has got a, 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 in 1994, he got a Nobel Prize in economics. And there's a story about his umbrella. New York City taxi drivers uh, not buying cheap flood insurance, focusing, generosity, sunk costs, and the cashmere sweater, risk aversion. I, I'm not going to have time for all these. Um, they, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned, I, I uh, marked in, in um, red what the those examples that I am uh, that I'm intending to cover today, I'm not sure that I'll be able to cover even all those, but I marked in red what I want to cover, and uh, but I leave this. Uh, um, I mention all these examples because in the question period you can ask me about anything you want out of these examples. Anything else you want also, but if you if you are particularly interested in one of these examples, I'll be glad to explain it. I have a slide prepared for it. So let's go, let's get started. Overeating, okay? The, now this is not behavioral economics, it's behavioral life. <laughs> it's behavioral uh, physiology, if you did. It's behavior, overeating. Behavior, Obese people often overeat. Obese people, people who are overweight, okay? And they overeat, they eat too much. The rule that they are following is the rule that we all follow. Eat when you're hungry, okay? And eat tasty food. And we all do that, all of us do it. We eat when we're hungry and we look for tasty food. Analysis. Though we need food for energy, growth, and various vital bodily functions, that is not what makes us eat. We eat because we're hungry and or enjoy food, okay? Hunger and food enjoyment are mechanisms that evolved in order to motivate us to eat. But evolution has not yet had time to take account of the sedentary nature of much of modern life. Okay? Evolutionarily, obesity is exceptional. Okay? This is not the, uh, the usual. The people in, 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 nowadays we have quite a few obese people, but, uh, uh, Previously, we didn't have, uh, I think even 100 or 200 years ago, there wasn't that much obesity. And certainly in, in, uh, in, uh, on the evolutionary time scale, people had to work hard in order to uh, uh, survive. And uh, there weren't very many obese people. So the rule, eat when you're hungry, eat tasty food is a rational rule. In spite of the fact that it's not rational, it does not promote the goals of obese people, okay? Uh, they, obese people very often uh, are not very healthy, okay? So it does not, uh, so, so that is a physiological example of my thesis, that evolution has, uh, uh, has uh, evolved, it, uh, uh, the mechanism of, of hunger and food enjoyment has evolved, and, uh, but, but, but uh, obesity is relatively rare, and therefore the rule does not take, into a, uh, take it into account. That's the first example. The second example is hyperbolic discounting. Hyperbolic discounting here, will describe the behavior. Offer a choice between $10 on the spot and $11 tomorrow. Some experimental subjects choose $10 on the spot, okay? 
whereas the same subjects offer a choice between $10 in a year and $11 in a year and a day, choose $11 in a year and a day. And that may be viewed as irrational or inconsistent, okay? What's going on over here? Uh, uh, yes, if, if you prefer $10, today to $11 tomorrow, then you should, what, what after a year passes, what difference does it make? So you, you could look at this as irrational. The rule that people are following is a proverb that says a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Okay, if you have something right now, okay, take it right now, okay. Uh, analysis. If you give me ten dollars now, I pocket it. I, I pocket it, and that's the end of the story. Eleven dollars tomorrow? Maybe yes, maybe no. You know, I don't, I don't know. Right now, I have the ten dollars in my hand. Come tomorrow, you know, I might be late. You might not show up. You might get. I don't know. <laughs> All right. There's a qualitative difference between now and later. Okay, now it's not a question of a day later, it's a question of now or later. Between 365 and 366 days, there's no such difference. Okay, so the, the, uh, this apparent irrationality that the behavioral economists point at is not irrational. There, there really is a difference between now and, and the difference is, that, you know, now is you give it to me now. Later, you know, you promise it. Maybe you keep your promise. Maybe you don't keep your promise. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next item, which is similar, actually. The discontinuity between a probability of a, a, a between certainty and a 99% probability. The behavior we're talking about is $100,000 with certainty might be preferred to a gamble yielding $150,000 with probability 99% and nothing otherwise, okay? Uh, and that, that does not sound uh, rational. It doesn't sound that people are promoting their goals with such a, uh, when they prefer 100,000 with certainty. So what's the rule? The rule is if you don't know, you don't know, okay? There's a big difference between certainty and 99%. And here I'll explain it. Probability assessments in everyday life are rarely objective. They're really governed by coin tosses, roulette wheels, or something like that. They're not, yeah. Uh, when you invite people to an intimate dinner with a handful of carefully chosen guests, and they say, the people you invite, 99% they'll come. This has happened to me, okay? 99% they'll come. That means that they want to be counted in. They want you to think that they're coming, but themselves reverse, reserve the right to opt out. That's what it means. 99% I'll come. <laughs> it doesn't mean 99%. It means I'd like to come, okay? I want you to reserve a place for me, but I'm not sure, okay? Maybe I'll opt out, okay? When a contractor tells you that 99% your house will be ready in eight months, okay, you'd better figure at least a year, <laughs> okay? He's saying 99%, okay? <laughs> but he, it, he's not, uh, it doesn't bind him, okay? Uh, if, he, if he doesn't, uh, if the house is not ready in eight months, okay, 1% happened. <laughs> Like the distinction between now and later, there's a qualitative difference in everyday speech 
between certainty and probability 0.99, okay? There's a big difference, and people go according to what they, uh, uh, what they find in everyday life, the rule, okay? So when they're offered, the, and if really, if really the 150,000 would go with a probability of 0.99 and on a roulette wheel, okay? Uh, in a in a in a in a, uh, a fair experiment, yeah, then certainly one will, should prefer hundred fifty thousand. But it's not that way, okay? It's not that way. The, the probabilities are not used that way in everyday life, okay? So so it's true that that that. Uh, uh, this maybe points to an irrationality, but it's not. Uh, that's it's not. That's not what usually happens. Okay, let's talk about the ultimatum game. This is very uh, a very interesting item. Yeah, fifteen minutes or twenty minutes, we can go. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're at number four already. I think. Uh, I think I I painted red six items. Okay, so we're doing okay. <laughs> Uh, Fine. Okay. okay. Uh, so in this game, there are two players: the proposer P and the res uh, the proposer and the responder, and they must divide a hundred euros. I don't know why I suddenly switched from uh, dollars to euros, but doesn't matter. Okay. If they agree, how each gets his agreed share. Okay, if not, both get nothing. But this is not the usual uh, negotiation setup. They sit at computers in separate rooms and cannot communicate directly. The proposal starts by making a numerical offer to the responder without words. He types a, a uh, he types a, an offer to the responder. The responder responds by clicking yes or no. No other response is possible. The game is then over. The players get their payoffs, if any, and leave by separate doors, okay? So if the responder rejects, both get nothing, okay? And they never get to see each other. They leave by separate doors, okay? They never see each other. No, they don't learn, they don't know who the other guy is. They don't learn each other. The subjects are students and they're not particularly long on money. They don't have a lot of money, okay? So a hundred euros is something, <laughs> okay? It, it's, uh, okay, now the behavior, that is observed is that most proposers offer around 35. See, the proposer has a big advantage, okay? Because, uh, because uh, uh, he can get most of it for himself because he figures that the responder is not gonna turn down a significant offer. So basically, if the proposer uh, proposed uh, a, a, a uh, a division of 90 euros to 10 euros, or even 95 to five euros, five euros is something, okay? Five euros is something. And and why should you walk away from five euros? So one could think that he would offer 95.5 or 90.10, but smaller offers, even 80.20 is rejected. In the experiments, it's rejected. That's irrational, yeah? It's irrational. Why should people walk away from, why should a student for whom 20 euros is money, yes? Why should he walk away from it? So the rule that they're following is don't let people kick you in the stomach, <laughs> okay? Reject lopsided offers. That's the rule. Don't let people kick you in the stomach, okay? Uh, the mechanism, the analysis is, the mechanism for executing the rule, like hunger for eating, our feelings of wounded pride, 
insult, desire for revenge, honor, things like that, okay? If you, uh, if you kick me in the stomach by offering me 80 to 20, yes, there's, I said to you, go to hell, yes, <laughs> yes uh, uh, okay? So what takes over is these, um, these feelings of wounded pride, insult, desire for revenge, okay? The rule and its mechanisms evolved in natural scenarios where the negotiators know each other. If in such scenarios you accept lopsided offers, you'll get a reputation for doing so. And in the future, you'll get only such offers, okay? You don't want to accept 80 to 20, yes? Because, uh, because everybody else in the future will think, oh, you're a, uh, you're a, in America, they use the word sucker, yes? Uh, 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 <coughs> you're a sucker, you're willing to take nothing, okay? So rejecting is highly rational. In the contrived, artificial ultimatum game. Negotiations don't take place that way, okay? Reputational effects don't apply as the players are totally anonymous. But the rule and its mechanism evolved in natural situations where they do apply. The rule is rational in spite of the fact that it's irrational in the contrived ultimatum game, okay? Let's go to the endowment effect. Dick Thaler got the, uh, the 1918, uh, the 2018 Nobel Prize, I think, uh, largely because of the endowment effect, okay? So let's see, uh, let's, uh, let's look at this endowment effect. What's going on? What's the behavior? In an experiment, subjects first given a Swiss chocolate bar were generally unwilling to trade it for a coffee mug. Where subjects first given a coffee mug were generally unwilling to trade it for a chocolate bar, okay? That's a paper of uh, Kahneman, Knetsch, and Taylor in 1991. All right, uh, so that is uh, apparently irrational. I mean, the, 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 uh, the subjects were picked at random. So it's unlikely that uh, people, uh, the people on the one side naturally prefer this uh, chocolate bar to the coffee mug and the others naturally prefer the coffee mug to the chocolate bar, okay? What is going on over here? Yes, why are they unwilling to trade it? So the rule is prefer your own unless you have good reason not to, okay? What, what belongs to you, uh, all, all other things being approximately equal, you prefer your own. That's why it's called endowment effect. You're endowed with your own. All right, now why is that rational to prefer your own, okay? <laughs> to prefer what belongs to you. So the analysis, already the 2000 year old Talmud notes, okay, this is in the Talmud, it's 2000 years old. A person prefers one measure of his own grain to nine measures of another's. Okay, well that's an exaggeration, okay, obviously that's an exaggeration. But uh, there is a, what's the reason for it? Presumably the reason is familiarity. You know what is in your own, uh, what, what your own grain, you know, you, you know what belongs to you, you're familiar with it. Would you trade your 2018 fiat for someone else's, <laughs> okay? You have a 2018 fiat uh, 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 and, and somebody else has a 2018 fiat, he says, let's trade. Yes. You wouldn't do that, okay? Because uh, you know that you, you know your own car and uh, you don't know the other person's car and well, why should you do that? You, I mean, it, probably if he is, probably 
if he is suggesting a trade, there's something wrong with this car, okay? Uh, uh, probably. So, so that, this, you, you didn't figure this out that probably there's something wrong, but you prefer your own. It's not that people figured this out rationally, but it has worked well for millennia under natural circumstances. So it has been internalized and it's automatically applied to trivial contrived situations like coffee mugs and chocolate bars where it doesn't really apply, okay? That is the endowment effect, okay? So we've gone through five of the famous experiments, oh no, no, four, because overeating is not is not behavioral economics, but we've gone through four of the famous experiments of um, behavioral economics. And now we will go to the fifth one, and that is uh, sunk costs. Okay, sunk costs, anchoring, Some costs, here we are. Okay. So the behavior. Now this, I'm, this is a quotation from Dick Taylor. Jeffrey and I somehow get two free tickets to a professional basketball game in Buffalo. Buffalo is a town in upstate New York. Normally an hour and a half drive from where we live in Rochester. The day of the game, there is a big snowstorm. We decide not to go, but Jeffrey remarks that had we bought the expensive tickets, we would have braved the blizzard and attempted to drive to the game, okay? And uh, Taylor writes, this is inconsistent with economic theory. Jeffrey is ignoring the economist's dictum to ignore sunk costs, meaning money that has already been spent. Okay, so in the second case, you've already spent the money and bought the tickets, okay? So, uh, so uh, you say, let's go to the game. Otherwise we'll lose the money that we have sunk into the tickets, okay? Uh, it's the sunk costs rule, okay? We'll lose the money that we have sunk into the tickets. But if we got the tickets for nothing, we won't lose anything. But that doesn't, it's irrational because what difference does it make? If you're, if you're going to, uh, if you're afraid of the blizzard, Okay, then you're afraid of the blizzard. Then you're not gonna get to the game, okay? You're not gonna get to the game if you think that the blizzard is so strong or you'll get stuck with your car, you'll have all kinds of problems. But, uh, uh, but that holds whether you bought the tickets or whether you didn't buy the tickets, it doesn't make any difference. So why should there be a difference in the behavior, okay? That is... Uh, uh, that is the challenge that uh, Taylor gives to, uh, it's behaving irrationally. It's, be, it's not promoting your goals. So the rule is buying expensive tickets shows that you really, uh, that you really want to go. It's not, that's a mistake. This is, this is the analysis, it's not the rule. It's the analysis is, I mean, this is a, a typo on the slide. The analysis is that buying expensive tickets shows that you really want to go. When you get them for free, you also want to go, but probably not with the same intensity of desire, okay? You got tickets, okay, let's go, <laughs> okay? But when you bought expensive tickets, all right, that shows that you really wanna go. There's a difference between 
uh, the uh, your desire, your actual desire to go, whether you bought the ticket or whether you got them for nothing. Some costs constitute a heuristic that subconsciously enables you to gauge your own feelings. Okay, when you so so uh, when when the when when you bought expensive tickets, that means you really want to go. Okay. When you got them for nothing, you know, you it's not so important. Okay, so that is, uh, um, that is, uh, uh, that covers the five examples out of the 17, uh, six examples out of the 17 that I have. And now I want to go to uh, the conclusion and then we'll have time for questions. Conclusions. Economic theory is valid after all. On the whole, people do behave rationally. It's not true that people don't behave as economists think. That, that is what the behavioral economists say, or that is what, the, that is the, the uh, um, that's the conclusion that uh, people derive from behavioral economics and it's not correct. But behavioral economics is also valid. Indeed, it's very important. People do not consciously optimize. They follow rules of thumb, okay? It, it, if you thought an economic theory that people figure things out that's not correct, okay? They don't figure things out. They follow rules of thumb. So it's important to know what the rules are. A restaurant serving wholesome but tasteless food will quickly go out of business, okay? Because the people don't go, the people don't eat because they need energy, they eat because they're hungry, okay? It's the, it's the, the rule, eat when you're hungry, that's what matters, not, uh, not the uh, uh, people follow the rules. So you better, uh, you better know what the rules are if you want to advertise something and sell something. The rules usually are uh, rational to obey, almost always, okay? But you better know what the rules are if you want to uh, if you want to succeed in business or, or in, in life in general. So in short, far from contradicting each other, economic theory and behavioral economics complement each other beautifully. Behavioral economics is what makes economic theory work, okay? because the rules are to the advantage of the, uh, uh, of, the uh, of, of the economic agent. So I don't know how to pronounce this, to but thank your, you to very much, yeah. thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we have one question uh, from YouTube channel, uh, they ask about what do you think of agent-based computational economics? You know, what is what? Agent-based computational economics. There is a such kind of sub-branch of economics, you know, they, they use computers in order to analyze bounded rationality and other things by the help of the computers and they call it agent-based computational economics. And Agent-based computational economics. Yes. Yeah. What do you think about it? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, I have. I. This is the first time I hear about it. Okay. So, uh, uh, no comment. Okay. <laughs> think. No comment. That I never. I never heard about it before. Okay. Um, Okay, I can, uh, okay. There's no question from YouTube channel. I can ask one question. About uh, so, uh, can we think the golden rule of ethics as rule rationality? Uh, uh, 
Well, uh, I, I think uh, I think not. Yes, <laughs> I think not because um, rule rationality means that the rule. First of all, one the, the, this uh, is based on the original definition of rationality. Okay. Uh, because. Uh, right. Here's, here's the definition of rationality, okay? People act to promote their goals. Rule rationality is, uh, um, rule rationality means people uh, uh, act to obey rules, and these rules are usually rational, okay? Usually they are rational in the sense that each person. <laughs> then promotes his own goals so it's not a, an example of the golden rule of ethics yes is not an example of rule rationality it's an example of rule ethics okay it's not by my definition of rationality okay now you could say uh, let's define rationality to be uh uh, to be to follow the golden rules, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Yes. Okay, yes. Yes. fine. So if you this is the rule. Adopt, if you adopt that rule, okay, then you'll get uh, moral uh, morality. You'll get uh, um, you'll get uh, 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 the uh, the philosophical. Um, uh, doctrine of morality that's very nice okay but, but it uh, but it's not going to dictate what people do because people i think uh in general they're willing to be moral but they first they give precedence to their own goals okay now <clears throat> uh, um uh, let me let me um bring an example of this okay Okay. In the 20th century, one of the uh, primary uh, um, economic or political doctrines was uh, socialism or communism, okay? Yeah. Now, we don't have that anymore in the 21st century, not very much, or not at all really, except perhaps in North Korea, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, which is... Uh, but, but in general, uh, we don't have that anymore. Why? Why don't we have it? Well, communism is based on the, uh, on the, um, uh, on the doctrine of to each according to his needs, from each according to his ability, okay? Now, I think that is a very beautiful doctrine, okay? It's, it's very nice, just like the golden rule, mm -hmm. do unto others as you would have others do unto you. It's a beautiful doctrine, yes? And, and I am enthusiastically in favor of it, okay? I'm enthusiastically in favor of, uh, of uh, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, and also, also to each according to his ability, from each according to his needs. Well, you know, everybody should give what he can, and and everybody should get what he needs. <laughs> it's very, very convincing. Yeah, there's only one small thing wrong with it. Okay, one small thing. It doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. Okay, it's beautiful. I signed down to it. It's but it doesn't work. Okay, and and that is what the whole twentieth century showed. Okay, from the beginning of the Russian Revolution, yes, until uh, uh, until 1979, when uh, when uh, uh, China uh, went to a market economy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 abolished socialism and went to a market economy and and uh, Vietnam went to a uh, market economy in 1985 okay 
and and uh, uh, and Russia abandoned socialism in 1989. Okay, it doesn't work. All right, and we have it in Israel also in the kibbutz. Okay, the kibbutz was based on uh, on uh, uh, socialist principle to each everybody in the kibbutz. Uh, um, uh, got what he needed and and everybody was supposed to give according to their ability okay yeah. but the kibbutz ceased to exist okay there are maybe out of maybe several hundred kibbutzim in Israel in 1960 yes today there are maybe two or three okay mm -hmm. that work according to this principle okay why is that why is it because People, t because it does not uh, correspond to incentives, okay? It gives the wrong incentives. If everybody has to get what he needs anyway, why should he work? Uh, why should he give according to his ability? You have to be a big ideologist, so you have to have studied Kantian philosophy for that, okay? But not everybody studied Kant. And among those people who studied Kant, not everybody got convinced. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Not everybody got convinced. Everybody got convinced. Maybe that that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that's the right thing to do. But not everybody got convinced to do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, that is that is my answer. Okay. In other words, rationality. I stick by uh, by. Uh, People act to promote their goals. I stick by that. And that is the definition of rationality. Okay? Mm -hmm. And if you have rule rationality, that means you develop rules that do that in general. Okay, that's my answer. Thank you very much for, for your answer. It's a, okay. And thank you very much for this delightful uh, presentation at the Sunday morning. Uh, I hope uh, we will meet maybe in the future after Corona in Turkey, uh, again in Istanbul. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Robert. Okay, my pleasure, my pleasure. I enjoyed the morning. Thank you very much. So uh, we will 